Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no-holds-barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean DeBias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. I'd like to welcome Carl Martin Lindell, the CEO of SVP Worldwide. Good to see you there, Carl Martin. Thank you. Thanks for having me here, Dean. Looks like a little gloomy day in Chicago. That is, yeah. a, live, that is a live shot, right? Yeah, it is. It is. It looks like we're going to be having rain here pretty soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time. Um, for those of you that um, don't know about uh, Carl Martin's company, it's fascinating. So uh, SVP Worldwide is the world's largest consumer sewing machine company, founded in 1851. That's a long time ago. Uh, they're headquartered in Tennessee now, upwards of uh, 4,000 employees worldwide, and the company products are sold in 180 countries through a mass network of thousands of dealers, as well as the usual suspects, Walmart, Costco, Joanne, Michaels, Amazon, Tmall, and many others around the world. Uh, there are three iconic brands that we'll talk about. One that many of you know is Singer, obviously, the most recognized. Um, it ranks number one in brand awareness, likelihood to purchase, and overall quality, according to a recent Gallup survey, which I found uh, fascinating that that name has been around for so long. Uh, it, so Carl Martin's product portfolio covers everything from entry-level sewing machines. You can get a Walmart for $60.00 up to machines that are $17,000, internet connected, leading edge types of units. And these are in-home units, so we'll touch on that. The market is big and wide, as you can imagine. It's about $3 billion in annual machine revenue, but the overall market is $40 billion. So that includes everything related to um, these types of products. And according to the Global Industry uh, Analyst Report, um, the market is experiencing a whole new renewed uh, global growth um, cycle right now. And in some countries, it's actually outpacing their uh, GDP growth. So that is something that really surprised me when I did some research. By the way, for those of you who are kind of stereotyping millennials most of the time, think again, they are one of the ones that's actually dri driving this uh, resurgence. And the second one I would probably say is this emerging middle class in developing countries who have a need to sell. In other words, they need it to support the household. And finally, um, now the group is owned by PE uh, Powerhouse uh, Eris Management, and Carl Martin and his expanding team have been delivering, I think, impressive growth, innovation, and performance over the last two years since you joined the company. So since you did join the company two years ago, I always want to ask, actually, it hasn't been, been two years yet, but you know, why did you take the CEO role of this company? You must have seen some fascinating opportunity, which I just kind of ran through. Um, maybe tell us about that and also jump into a little bit about the product mix and your portfolio of brands would be really great. Yeah, for sure, Dean. Yeah, good question. I got a phone call in, I think, April of 2018 from um, Aris Management had just acquired uh, the business and they were looking for a permanent CEO. There was an interim CEO at the time. And my initial reaction was similar to what you alluded to in your opening, that sewing machines must be in a declining business. Right. I'd in major appliances that grows usually one to two percent a year and then I'd gone from there to small kitchen appliances where there is no growth globally at all it's a flat industry so I was thinking do I really want to go to a declining industry but then I learned actually sewing machines are growing globe they're growing about five percent per year uh, in the beginning of the 2000s wow so that's I mean you came from Whirlpool that's actually a good number because some sectors aren't even doing that that, that's right. So around 2015, there was a change where the industry has gone now into growing pretty steadily and it, it's projected to continue to grow about 5% over the next 10 years, 5% per year. But during the coronavirus lockdown, we have seen in developed countries an, an explosion in growth where people have uh, gotten into sowing to an extent that uh, we had not anticipated at all. Yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. I mean, a forty billion dollar overall market. I know that includes everything. You know, the products that you probably are never going to be involved in. But that, to me, just looks like great opportunity expansions for your guys. Um, is that um, is that 
are all those categories things that you uh, can look at in terms of playing with, in terms of partnerships and growth and innovation, or are you pretty much, um, you know, we'll get into your technology sector here in a minute, but I'm just curious, for instance, like millennials, that was a surprise, right? It's like they are driving a lot of the growth. Um, so let's just take that opportunity as an example. That is that self-expression? Where's this, where's that coming from? Yeah, millennials are accounting for about 65% of the total growth of the industry wow. uh, on a global basis. So they are a big force. And we see there is not just one single trend. We see multiple trends in the millennial space. So it's it's not that easy to just point to one. But there sure. is a maker movement, spending more of your time and money on making things as opposed to purchasing things. There is a trend around customization. Uh, people will buy a summer dress and cut off the sleeves and hem them, etc. It's simple um, personalization. There is also the upcycling uh, trend. Uh, clothing is a huge opportunity uh, to to re for reuse, rewear, and, and upcycling, and we are seeing that. And there are also some. Um, there is a self-expression, just small embroidery, small touches on clothes. Yeah. Uh, we see millennials will buy a pair of jeans and put a small little embroidery on them to make it their touch. But there are also niches. Uh, costume play or cosplay is a very fast growing uh, trend and sewing is critical. Uh, these are consumers who will for one um, cosplay event like Comic Con or similar, they will spend easily $500 on a costume. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I've, it, I've, been, so, I've been to that. Yeah, OK, so you know it. Yeah. So there are multiple drivers there uh, and they're a little bit different when you look at Europe versus North America. Uh, what people sow and, and why they get into it. But millennials mm -hmm. are a big, big driver of the growth we're seeing, absolutely. Tell me about, you said something, upscale, what was it called? Uh, we call it upcycling. Upcycling, and, what is yeah. Is that like hand-me-downs? What is that? Yeah, it's, it's taking a quilt that you may have had and turn it into a dress or a bag, um, oh. weaves. Um, and uh, we see a fairly, when, when we post on our social media vehicles, uh, ideas, um, upcycling is always one that creates a lot of interest. Um, it's obviously, um, we have consumers that are very conscious about sustainability, the environment and reusing as opposed to throwing away uh, and, and alterating, is, it's certainly a trend we're seeing. Yeah, one of the trends in retail, uh, which is one of the ones that isn't very good, obviously, is the uh, apparel sector. So it's been devastated in COVID. And so people have found themselves wearing or using the same things. And that has not been a priority purchase item. Has that um, impacted, you know, the, the self-creation of, of clothing or, or reusing products and services or, or using products you already have in your, um, in your um, wardrobe? Um, to, to some extent, we, we have seen during uh, the time frame with the coronavirus lockdowns when people are adhering to a shelter in place order, yep. we have seen practically everywhere in the world an increased demand for sewing machines. We're doing some research now to understand exactly what they're being used, but we know to, to some extent it is for face mask making, respirator covers, either for themselves, for their families, or in many, many cases to donate to the local healthcare systems to help out. Um, that That is a real um, trend. We have donated ourselves thousands of machines to help consumers and local um, not-for-profit organizations to help out. Uh, so face mask making or respirator cover is one. The other is just call it home entertainment. We're locked mm. down. You can't go out. You have more time on your hands. We see um, people picking up sewing. We see people teaching their kids how to sew. And there, the, the feedback we're getting, it's not so much buying or making apparel because they can't go out and buy. It's right. more the entertainment factor, the hobby of making something that seems to be the big driver. Right. And uh, we, we are obviously very excited about this trend. Watching me um, make something on a sewing machine would be great entertainment value. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that in the technology uh, overview because I really want to get to that. But during COVID again, um, you know, besides your massive network of retailers and dealers and distributors, you also have almost 200 of your, of your own stores. What, what, what did you have to shut all those down? 
Uh, at the peak, we had 85% of our own stores shut. Uh, mm -hmm. we, our stores are uh, spread in the US. So depending on which municipality or which county or which state we were in, we had to adhere to uh, their uh, regulations, which were quite different. And they, tended, they tended to change on a daily basis. So we've been trying to be nimble. But at peak, 85% of our stores were closed. Now we have started to reopening them because states are relaxing the regulations. So at the moment, right. more than 90% are open again. So we went to practically no sales to now we're back up and we have all these consumers that have been not being able to buy their favorite products and they're coming in through the stores and um, basically fighting to get the last piece we have to sell. That's amazing. Um... So during the pandemic, it, you could have almost, maybe in some countries, maybe not the U.S., have been deemed as essential because some of the developing countries, they really rely on this equipment to uh, for livelihood. We, we were. In some states, we did qualify as essential services, and that's why the reason we didn't have to close 100 percent of the stores. So oh, in the, U, in the U.S.? Oh, in the U.S., yeah. yeah. Pri primarily because the local healthcare systems needed help getting covers for respirators and uh, you need sewing machines, you need fabric, you need thread, you need needles to do that, elastic. So that's um, what we've been helping out um, and doing. And we have even had our own employees volunteer to help out. As I mentioned, we have donated machines. We have um, helped out with uh, instructions on how to make the masks, etc. So yeah, it's been a big push to try to help out. Yeah, I bet. Um, you have, unlike some other competitors, really invested in R&D, and uh, I think your latest press release said up to $110 million is going to be invested over the next five years. You've got R&D centers, software development centers all over the world. Um, you're opening up a new one, I think, in Sweden that's coming up this year. Um, tell us about that. Is, by the way, Sweden, is that... Is that important? I mean, isn't that like where this all started like 150 years ago? Or is, is that just that country seems to be an epicenter of this type of uh, industry equipment and stuff? Yeah, so um, we have an R&D center in Sweden. It's our largest. We have another one in the UK focused on software development. We have a we have our R&D center in Shanghai in China, and we have uh, one in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So th those are four main sites. The Sweden site, it comes from the legacy of the Husqvarna brand. Uh, uh. The Husqvarna brand, is, it was a, it's a 500-year-old brand, tr old Swedish brand, started out making basically guns when Sweden went to war. And uh, Sweden started to become uh, less prone to go out and fight in Europe. They had to do something else, and they actually switched to sewing machines around 1860. And uh, at that point, they developed the Husqvarna Viking sewing machines uh, in the town of Husqvarna. And we are opening up a new R&D center in October in uh, the Husqvarna area. Uh, we have outgrown the current facilities. We are hiring aggressively. We are effectively doubling uh, the size. And we, we just needed a new space for ourselves. Uh, so it's exciting. The building is being constructed and uh, we're ready to move in in the fall. And that's in line with our investment. As you said, we, we made a commitment about a year and a half ago uh, with, a, with the backing of our new owners. We had the financial resources to make a big commitment to build the best product portfolio in the world. Uh, we um, have already started to invest and uh, the commitment, uh, you're right, it's about $112 million. Um, and um, we are starting to see uh, this year and more so next year and even more so the following years, the output of that. And, and that's exciting. And, and one thing that was new, you asked me how, how I got into the role. Yeah. I was mm -hmm. blown away by the technology advancement in sewing machines. I, I had in mind this very traditional mechanical sewing machine that hasn't changed much right. in the last 40 years. Right. And uh, I got to the company and they were taking out their iPhones and taking pictures of a dog and pressing a button and it's uploading to the machine and stitching it out on a t-shirt. and. It was just mind-boggling how far ahead um, the, the this sewing machine company was compared to the, the large Fortune 100 company I came from in terms of technology development. So, so that's been exciting to see cloud-based services, 
we can check anywhere in the world, you know, is a machine running out of thread and send notices to people uh, that time to go back to your embroidery machine and put in the red thread again because you're running out here in a couple of minutes. So uh, the, the, the opportunities are endless, digitization. Uh, we're getting now into artificial intelligence, which is very, very exciting too. So it, it is uh, certainly a space with, with a lot of um, technology. Um, and I, I like to tell the story, our former head of electronic uh, development in R&D, mm -hmm. he, he worked on developing Sweden's last generation fighter jet. And Whoa. he said that was a walk in the park compared to developing <laughs> electronics for a sewing machine because you have 800 moving parts with yeah. a, lo a lot of tolerances trying to get that needle to hit with the precision of a hundredth of a millimeter. So a lot, yeah, a lot of exciting technology in the products. Yeah, you've got physical technology, machine technology. And now you're bringing in AI and software and cloud. It, uh, it, uh, I guess the the uh, the whole AI machine learning has a uh, triple entendre here in your category. The uh, so it sounds like there's hope. Even someone like me could probably make something. Um, I'm definitely an impulse buyer. What what level machine would I need to buy <clears throat> to be able to make that T-shirt? Just by like, I know I have to. You know, so it, it lets me know, for instance, when I have to fill up modules thread, for instance, kind of just like my HP thing comes up on the screen here, says change the cartridge. I always think they're pushing it a little early on that, by the way. It's like the oil change guys, right? It's like 3,000. I'm like, I'm thinking 5,000. But anyway, um, so how, um, yeah, what would I have to get like a, a $1,000 machine to kind of have fun like that? Because I, if I have to like, get too involved I'll, I'll I won't yeah. use it right and 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 maybe I'm the wrong demo but maybe not I mean there's boomers looking for stuff to do um and then the kids because I've seen you know young girls mostly you know using machines even the cheap ones seem to have technology built in that they can get going right away because there was always that frustration time to get people using things yeah no you can get a um, basic computerized machine uh, where you have the regular buttons to press and you don't need to worry about dials and so forth uh, yeah. at around $150. If wow. you want full uh, IoT experience, cloud-based services, delivery of design libraries over the air, etc., right yeah. now you would need to spend around $5,000. But obviously in our development, the technology is getting cheaper and we have the goal to bring the technology into lower price point and make it more accessible to people. So over time, um, already next year will be a big step in that direction and the year thereafter will come with, the, with versions that are more accessible from a price point. So very much like computers and, and printers, just the price points continue to drop and it becomes more and more of a mass market and swapping out modules and accessories and you know all the things if you look at your desktop in front of you all the little accessories that you're plugged into um you know companies like logitech have turned into multi-billion dollar companies just not even controlling the core you have the core uh, and potentially accessories all right so there's hope there but um i'm really fascinated by the whole software ai machine learning where, where is this going to go is it just sewing machines is it sewing machines hooked up to my phone is it should we even call it a sewing machine anymore? I feel like it never got a good buzzword name, by the way. Yeah, it's it's funny. When we go to um, certain events like Comic-Con, yeah. and we have embroidery machines running to demonstrate what they can do, we are often asked if it's a 3D printer. So yes. we should probably be exactly. thinking um, changing the names of, of certain machines. Yeah, no, t technology will help. If you'd ask people, what is the dream scenario for someone who's not a sewer? It mm -hmm. is maybe to be able to take a picture of a shirt you see, take a picture with your phone, upload it, and it will literally stitch it out. Right. Uh, th that is, but that's for someone who is more focused on the output. We also have to recognize that the vast majority of our sewers, we, we talk about them as need to sew or want to sew. People who fall in the want to sew category, they enjoy the actual sewing. So for them, automating the process is actually the opposite we're looking for. Uh, but if we want better output, higher quality output, and uh, helping people get more consistent output, that is helpful everywhere. 
and uh, there are the the accessory uh, space is tremendously large um, with a with a sewing machine. A, a person who owns a seventeen thousand dollar sewing machine, um, they will do sewing and embroidery, and on the sewing side, they may own 30, 40 different presser feet which could cost well over $100 each to do specific applications. So helping that output is where a lot of technology can help. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's fascinating. I'm uh, um, chairman of a 3D printing company, but the the consumer sector there, you know, was hyped up, didn't quite make it. So if you look at the Gartner hype cycle, they kind of fell off the grid, whereas enterprise, so, you know, meter by meter by meter, where you can actually print prototypes and print things is uh, is booming, quite frankly. But the there seems to be some connected tissue here between 3D printers and what you're doing, um, maybe not physically so much, because people are trying to replicate things on printers. Um, the um, It just seems like there's a uh, an interesting opportunity to, to take... For instance, the fast fashion, the I need to have that. There's a lot of people, a lot of the websites like Instagram and others will, you know, be able where you'll be able to click on something, say, I want what she's wearing, and it takes you to the e-commerce site where it, it sells it, but it could just actually make it for you. Um, yeah. are there are by the way, are there businesses that are doing that? They're buying a bunch of your machines and saying, you know, we can do this on demand printing, let's call it, of clothing. Um, is that a business? There, there is a business. They tend, if you look in Europe and North America, they will buy more traditional, what we call industrial machines. So machines that are meant yeah. to run 24-7 and right. they have higher output. Uh, we do have some of those products as well. But if you go into uh, any embroidery shop that maybe make uniforms for people, uh, nurses, doctors, and they want their logo embroidered, they want their name embroidered, etc. Uh, okay. They will use more commercial equipment. But if you go to developing market, parts of Latin America, Asia, um, there we will see that they will use what we would consider consumer product um, because they're much cheaper than the industrial products and they will use them for commercial purposes. So we call them the need to sew markets where people will use a hobby or consumer sewing machine to supplement their income. They will maybe produce 10 bags that will cost $5 to make and they will sell them uh, and make $50 for them. And, and that's how they supplement it. So it's not just mending, it's actually making business out of it at a fairly small scale though, for sure. Yeah, that's all right. Entrepreneurialism is, uh, entrepreneurialism, I should say, is is, is hot in, in many markets and this is an enabler and, and a low cost one. Aren't there some machines that are still like hand cranking? Do you, do you guys still sell those? We do. We do sell. Um, they're called 15 class machine, cast iron machine, absolutely beautiful, all metal. Wow. Um, you can run them either with a pedal or with a hand crank, or you can hook them up to a motor. Uh, they have very, very high speed. They run forever and they are popular in, uh, in India alone. There, there is almost 3 million units of those sold a year. Is that, a, is that an electricity thing or more of a control of the speed with my foot or my hand? What What's the... So first and foremost, it's a cost aspect. If you take out uh, the motor and the drive, the machine yeah. gets much cheaper. Um, but also in places where you don't have reliable electricity delivery, you mm -hmm. may need the, the pedal or the hand crank because there will be times when the machine wouldn't operate. So back um, to the... Um, you know, developed countries. If you look at a, uh, you know, Costco or Walmart, obviously they're just selling them in the box. Um, but you've got other stores <clears throat> like Joanne and others that have, um, you know, expertise on the floor. Do you find this is a uh, um, kind of like beauty products, kind of an, a high engagement um, selling situation? Oh, I'm sure it is for the person that already owns a machine or two, but like for the new buyers, or are they yeah. just walk? Are they just walking in and grabbing one? Uh, when you buy your first machine, you usually start at the very basic machine and those are not assisted sales. But when you start to get up to the mid and higher end range, uh, those are highly assisted sales processes. Our dealer network, they will create a one day, two day, and in some cases even a three day event where they invite a small group of people, you work on projects, and you learn to take out the full capability of the machine. And then at the end of the event, 
they will be presented with a very attractive offer to buy the machine and take it home with them. And when you start to get into machines that cost $5,000 and above, uh, very few of those are, are sold um, without any form of event or instruction or education that goes with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so very, very highly assisted. And, and that's why you have two tiers of the market. You have, you mentioned Walmart, uh, Amazon and the likes where you have no assisted sale at all. Um, it's hard to sell higher price point, but when you get into a dealership or a Joanne where you have a trained sales staff, yep. uh, you have the ability to, to sell the more advanced machines that requires the demonstration. Is that something um, kind of still stuck in a, at least I think we're at epidemic phase now, maybe not pandemic, but um, is that something that can be done remotely at all or digitally? I mean, you kind of need the machine yep. though. We, we have tried, and um, that's one of the areas where the coronavirus will have a lasting impact on our business, is that we deliver uh, thousands of events uh, with consumers and dealers every year. And we have found have now had to find a way to deliver them remotely. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have tried with live events, very much like we're sitting here talking, uh, but we are also trying recorded uh, classes uh, we already uh, had invested a substantial amount of money in um, classes that are available on YouTube and other channels. Uh, but now we pushed it beyond a short 30 minute class to, to full day events or multi day events that are delivered remotely. And if that turns out to be an effective solution, we can reach a much, much larger consumer base much faster, especially people who may live in areas where their closest dealer or high-end sewing machines uh, store is too far away to, to drive to. And so it's an exciting development. And I think we will ultimately reach a larger consumer base because of it. Yeah. So where do you see the uh, this all going? You know, you've mentioned a lot of cool stuff that I think most, most people are a little surprised that you're uh, how much of a tech company you are. Uh, in terms of partnerships and growth and new product innovation, where uh, where do you see things in a few years? Yeah, so we have um, a big effort underway. As the industry leader, we represent about 35% uh, of all sewing machines sold globally. We need to help create demand for sewing. Sewing is growing, but we want it to grow faster. And that's an area where we are looking at a large degree of partnerships. Um, we um, most recently we are partnering with Amazon and sponsoring Making the Cut, uh, which is a new fashion show with Heidi Klum. I Klum's. saw that. Yeah, yeah. Tell us. It's it's an it's an exciting. The interest and um, interest in a senior brand uh, has, has shot up tremendously because of that. We have a large base of influencers we work with. Um, we also work with more niche. We have several cosplayers that we work closely with and partner with. We had partnership with Disney last year around the Maleficent uh, movie that was launching, uh, yeah. where we did uh, all of the costumes were sewn using Singer sewing machines. So kids and can make uh, make their own outfits and. Exactly. Exactly. And they would um, sell. Do they sell kits of? prepackaged materials that just need to be woven together, so to speak? There are companies that sell kits. It's yeah. uh, quite common. Um, but also, when you when you look into cosplay, most people do not want an off-the-shelf solution. They're looking yeah. for something they create themselves. Uh, so they're typically quite skilled uh, sewers. Uh, but we certainly see kits, particularly in Asia. There are tons of kits you can buy where everything is in needed except the sewing machine, but the fabric, the thread, the needles, etc. And it's ready to go. And we're partnering with that. We are uh, partnering with a lot of fashion designers, uh, some are fashion designers and that partner with Singer, uh, attended New York Fashion Week here earlier in the year. So, so there are a number of partnerships that we do to bring new sewers in. Um, we are partnering also with uh, fashion schools around the world. In many countries around the world, we will have TV shows uh, where our machines are used and uh, we help just bring interest into sewing. That's probably the biggest opportunity for partnership for us is to create 
more of interest, knowledge, education, and demand for sewing. Right. Uh, so that's an area that we have been uh, stepping up the game and investing substantially in. You need like your own TV show, like the the biggest sewer or something. Or maybe they already have one, but. Uh... Yeah, it's uh, fascinating, uh, Carl Martin. We appreciate you uh, joining us. And uh, it's uh, interesting to see how you've made such a quick impact uh, as the CEO of this company. A lot of good things ahead. Any um, any parting words for uh, leaders of companies out there just uh, kind of navigating the next six months here and reopening their businesses and, you know, kind of moving back to corporate life in the office? Um, I, w I wish I had good words because <laughs> I, I don't think any of us knew exactly what will happen here. And uh, uh, it feels like um, the uh, planning horizon has shrunk from maybe looking a couple of years out now to looking a week out or two weeks out to, to adjust your business. Um, I, I think if there's one thing I think we all need to think about is stepping up the game in communicating with employees. We have to recognize it, it, it's a stressful time we all have lived through here and are living through and it's um, impacting all of us and uh, not seeing each other as frequently by working remotely, uh, trying to augment the, uh, the communication and complement that by staying very close is, is something that uh, we have seen tremendously helpful. We have stepped it up a lot and I feel that we have not gotten even halfway to where we need to be. But that uh, that is something that I view as critical to keep the business and the organization rolling the way it should yeah and keep people's mental health in check too um you know i always recommend getting away from the screen uh maybe meditating yoga but now i'm going to recommend people maybe go pick up a sewing machine i like that <laughs> uh thanks for coming on uh, you're looking good in chicago and we will see you soon thank you thanks for having me dean yep see you <laughs>